Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you so much to the previous two presenters for your great talks. I'm going to be talking about something a little different today. Um, this is work that I completed uh, as part of a master's capstone at Scripps in Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego. Um, and I'll be talking you through my development of a global seafloor observation scenario exploration tool, which I made using ArcGIS Experience Builder. So by way of introduction, we once thought that the deep sea floor was featureless and barren, and we now know that it's rich with life. And just like on land, our seafloor is characterized by varied terrain and geomorphology, and this place hosts to amazing biodiversity and vibrant ecosystems. But over the last century, we have visually observed only a tiny fraction of our 330 million square kilometers of the global deep sea floor. However, this observation um, that we've been able to make happen has already uncovered so many new species that are um, have never before been seen or documented. Um, we found evidence of unique adaptations for extreme light pressure and temperature conditions that are only present in the deep ocean. And we've been able to identify key pieces of global ocean, earth, and climate processes as well as resources. And learning about the deep ocean and seafloor through specifically visual observation, that is seeing these environments in images or video footage is very critical for in increasing our understanding of our ocean and planet. And there's a real need to accelerate this kind of observation as well as corresponding conservation action ahead of resource extraction efforts like deep seabed mining, deep sea fishing, and other potentially destructive activities. And so today I wanna to talk about accelerating uh, deep sea exploration through GIS-based tools. I'll give a quick overview of the observation activities to date and some capacity um, and barriers to global participation. And then I wanna talk through um, a prototype web app that I've developed to increase access, accelerate planning, and facilitate collaboration through GIS data. So this work started with a look at the history of global deep ocean exploration. Um, we estimate that the total seafloor area covered by visual observation activities to date is about the same as the area of Rhode Island. So we've only looked at about 1,300 square miles of our seafloor. To get this estimate, um, I worked with a number of people to source metadata for all of the submersible dives, seafloor camera toes, and fixed camera stations that have been used over the last century to um, take a look at the deep sea floor and deep sea habitats. And together, these data sets totaled about 48,000 individual sites and I've represented each site here with a yellow dot on the map. And what you may notice um, is that there's a very striking pattern of seafloor exploration happening very close to coastal regions of uh, mostly the global north. So 78% of the seafloor exploration activities in our records fell within countries 200 mile exclusive economic zone. That's the zone that they're able to control without um, global oversight. And I've outlined this um, in white on this map. So it's quite close to the, the coast. And we see that there are few observations, fewer um, of those yellow points in um, areas beyond national jurisdiction. Furthermore, 92% of the activities within these zones were organized and undertaken by just five countries. And these are the USA, Japan, New Zealand, France, and Germany. And this aligns with what we already know about historical access to the resources, technology, and infrastructure that are required to pursue seafloor exploration. And these all tend to be concentrated in the global north. And this is mirrored in the map by the dark blue countries.
So in looking at these records, we quickly discovered that current exploration just isn't representative. The focus on coastal regions of mostly the global north fails to reflect the goals and priorities of all nations with interests and access to the deep ocean and deep sea floor. And I won't talk too much about this today, but the areas that we as a global community have explored also don't reflect the full range of global ocean research regions, depth zones, and seafloor geomorphology. Focusing for now on expanding participation in deep seafloor exploration, um, an organization that I partner with, the Ocean Discovery League, released the results of a global deep sea capacity assessment. And this assessment provided a multifaceted picture of deep sea research interests, as well as technical and human capacity for 186 geographical areas across the globe. And these included key access metrics for resources like infrastructure, funding, data and software, expertise, and deep sea technology and vessels. What they found was that the areas surveyed in the assessment varied widely in both their stakeholder interests and their capacity and resources for deep sea research. Different areas had unique combinations of deep sea priorities, expertise, and capacity and resource access needs. And this complexity demands a more flexible community-driven set of strategies for exploration and conservation planning ones that need to be responsive to area-specific priorities. And my goal was to embrace this need for flexible strategies in the case of seafloor exploration. And really this is um, aimed at helping stakeholders figure out where the best locations for seafloor exploration might be given their area-specific priorities, goals, and any constraints on technology or expertise. And to do this, I developed a dynamic web-based seafloor observation scenario exploration tool. And this is um, done in ArcGIS Experience Builder. And this tool allows users to adjust the importance of different considerations like depth ranges, coastal proximity, vessel traffic, and other aspects based on their priorities. And it uses these considerations to generate a heat map of regions that fit these priorities. Um, and if this sounds like a kind of suitability modeling process, that's exactly what it is. Um, and I'll get into the details now. So as I mentioned, I use the ArcGIS Experience Builder um, web app platform to develop a way of undertaking real-time suitability modeling that weights relevant um, exploration factors. And if you're familiar with suitability modeling, you might know that it typically is undertaken for things like urban planning and habitat conservation. And this is a novel use of this kind of strategy for um, marine spatial planning and conservation. And our global coverage rasters combine data on bathymetric and ge geological features, as well as jurisdictional boundaries on human activity and historical observation sites. Um, what I'd like to do is just walk you through how this suitability modeler works. Um, so if you'll bear with me, I'll just share a new screen. Um, and I'll provide a link at the end of this talk to anyone who's interested in exploring the, this themselves. So the seafloor observation scenario exploration tool operates on a global scale. And um, the main import of this tool is this suitability modeler pane on the right hand side. What this allows you to do is select layers or really factors of interest in your modeling. And so here we might be interested in um, relationship to an exclusive economic zone, seafloor depth, and let's say vessel traffic density in planning our um, suitability planning model. Once you've selected the areas of interest or the 
um, layers of interest, excuse me, you can then design your model in the same way you might undertake suitability modeling um, offline and give each of those layers its own weight. And the only constraint here is that you need to weight all of your layers of interest so that they sum to 100% um, of the model weighting. So let's say we think that depth is very important, exclusive economic zone, proximity is somewhat important, and vessel traffic density at the end is um, also somewhat important. Then you have the option of jumping into each individual layer and weighting the levels of each factor. So um, we can highly weight being within an exclusive economic zone, for example. Taking a closer look at the seafloor depth layer, um, this allows us to adjust how we prioritize different regions of the seafloor that lie at different depths. And this is especially important to countries and communities that have limited access to depth rated technology. So let's say we are in an area um, where we only have access to technology that can withstand pressures at 4,000 meters and shallower. We'll upweight all of those and, um, and downweight areas that we can't or depth ranges that we can't access. And finally, we may be interested in avoiding vessel traffic or um, taking advantage of opportunistic ways to drop sensors and other equipment off of vessels. So in this case, we want low to very low vessel traffic in our regions of interest. Um, and once that's um, set, we can run our model. And what this um, modeling provides is a global heat map for the entire global ocean. But typically, we're not interested in um, the entire globe. We might be interested in one specific region. And so if we travel to the Pacific coast of Mexico, we can um, zoom into that region and use selection tools, either hand-drawn in the case of these two buttons or by selecting a specific layer uh, and identifying a region of interest for our model. And um, with this weather, my, uh, my internet connection is a little slow, but you can see that it populates a heat map with red being highly suitable and green being less suitable. And when you draw your region of interest, you're given a pie chart type breakdown of the areas that are um, high and low suitability based on what you've given the modeler. And so here we see that off the, the Pacific coast of Mexico, we have quite a few regions in our selected polygon that are um, have high suitability and fairly few that have very low to extremely low suitability. And so we can use that to guide where we place our um, exploration and conservation efforts. I'm gonna stop sharing this and see if I can return to my slide deck. And so just in these last few minutes, I want to talk about a few things under the hood of this tool. It's developed using a weighted raster lay that is hosted as an imagery layer. And this is very important for making these um, global rasters accessible in real time. In addition, each um, layer requires its own hosted tile layer for each raster data set used. And you also have the um, ability to export your resulting suitability model for offline use. Um, then, of course, you saw that there was a web map underlying all of this. And for that, I used vector and raster layers that corresponded to um, the layers used in the suitability modeler tool. You can also include, and I've done this, but there's not a lot of time to go through it, um, optional coordinate 
and measurement widgets in um, the Experience Builder tool that will allow users to see in real time the precise lat long coordinates um, or distances between points. And finally, you can add informational flyout panels for descriptive purposes and or external links to things like story maps or data sets to make this an even more interactive and involved experience. Um, the way in which this tool is built has some broader impacts. Um, Web-based tools like this sidestep the need for GIS software and expertise in initial planning. And this is huge for countries that don't have the technology access or expertise and capacity to do this kind of suitability modeling on their own. Image-based raster overlays allow real-time suitability modeling that can be refreshed and adjusted. And this is on a global scale. And if you've ever tried to use global data sets within a desktop version of ArcGIS, you know that they can be extremely slow. And so being able to use these image-based layers to generate suitability modeling results is a very big deal. And finally, the suitability modeling approach itself is fairly new to the area of conservation planning at this scale and for the, the ocean, but it's responsive to a wide range of user priorities and constraints, which makes it a fantastic tool for exactly this kind of collaborative exploration planning and conservation marine spatial planning task. Um, so I have a lot of future plans for using this interface. Most of them involve adding additional layers of data. Um, and I'm about to add layers on seabed, seabed lithology, so the composition of the seafloor um, and sediments, as well as sediment thickness and um, existing marine protected areas. And in the future, we want to be able to find high resolution and um, high confidence data on dissolved um, oxygen and particulate organic carbon as productivity variables that might support life on the seafloor, as well as international fishing areas and international seabed mining contract areas. And finally, I'm working with a lot of um, individual partners to find high resolution seafloor observational data for small areas and to integrate that into this tool so that when we have high resolution data, we can use it for these planning purposes. Okay, and with that, I just wanna say some quick thank yous um, to the UCSD GIS librarians, above all, Amy Work and uh, Ki Kim, and um, my partners at the Ocean Discovery League, Esri Oceans, the um, Scripps Marine Biodiversity and Conservation Program, and the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy Community. Uh, if you want to explore this tool on your own time, there's a shortened link there. And um, I also just published a Frontiers in Marine Science paper detailing the development of this tool. And you can find that open access at that, um, at that link as well. Um, and please feel free if you have any questions about how to develop this kind of tool or um, want to get involved in this particular case study, reach out to me um, at my email, kjohannes at ucsd.edu. Um, and I think that's probably at time for me. Um, thank you. Great presentation. Um, yes, very insightful. Um, so we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask your questions. Well, I'm curious, so. <laughs> and I can also reshare my slides. It's just nice to see everyone's face. Yes. Oh, no worries. Um, I was I was going to mention MPAs. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was curious about the layers. So are the layers you're using, because you have EEZ, so is the um, sea depth within EEZ or? Um... So these are all um, 
effectively global layers that are stacked on top of one another. So um, we have the complete global bathymetry model from GEBCO that um, includes the areas within EEZs. So um, the exclusive economic zone boundaries are superimposed on existing bathymetry data. But to my kind of closing point about adding more high resolution data, there are some countries who have done um, more detailed exploration of the deep seafloor within their exclusive economic zone. And so um, I'm trying to get my hands on all of those data layers as well. Great, thank you. Um, and so I would assume that the vessel traffic in uh, is the same as well. It's not exclusive to the EZ zone. Correct. Yeah. And I'm sorry, this is a, it's hard to get a complete overview of, of all of the different data that went into this project, but I'll put a link in the chat to the Frontiers in Marine Science paper that we just published on this. And it has details of where to access all of those data. Um, the vessel traffic density, for example, came from um, IMF and, uh, and a a few of those like international um, management partners. So let me just. Yes, thank you. Um, and then one more question in terms of um, it's kind of like related in terms of like the data, how much of your data was from primary sources versus secondary? Um, in terms of like public availability and would someone interested um, in, to replicate this work be able to do so? Um, yeah, um, so in terms of replication, absolutely. Four of our five um, GIS data sets were um, published global layers that can be accessed through the Esri Living Atlas and oftentimes can be um, accessed as uh, original shape files or data files from um, different partners. So if you if you check out that paper, it has all of the links to those data sets. And then we are in the process of making our historical observation record data available to everyone. We've just had to, because we sourced it very individually. So we contacted every country that had deep sea research and sourced all of these data, um, we've had to make sure we have sharing agreements in place to be able to share the raw data for that. But we're working on it now. Um, so hopefully in the next month or so, we'll have it all up. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you. Again, we have some time to take more questions. Please uh, feel free to drop questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, and yeah. Oh, my, my bad. Okay, that makes sense. Let me um, check this. I always get lost in Zoom settings. <laughs> okay, I think you should be able to right now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. Just reiterating the question I popped in the chat. I was wondering, um, you had mentioned that there was kind of a lacking of mapping in the global south as well as kind of more. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> my, my name is Ayodiji Olatunde. I'm of I'm a first year grad student from the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'll be working. I'm I'm working with Professor Leila on ground on groundwater potential zones in California. This is the research I did when I was in Nigeria during my during my graduate internship in Lagos State, Nigeria. I used the analytical hierarchical process to to assess the groundwater potential zones in Lagos State, Nigeria.
so for my study, I grew up in Lagos State, Nigeria, where I had all my life. I'm motivated to do this research because, because while growing up, uh, there have not been any issue or, or any reason why I should run Elta Skelter for water resources. So I begin to query this kind of this, this kind of findings that why is it that in Lagos State that we have relatively calm water resources, no no scarcity of water, no reason to own elter scatter for 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 water. So I, I wanted to so I, as a GIS analyst, I I wanted to know probably the zones, the area, the locations whereby we have this rich groundwater resources in Lagos State, Nigeria. And according to the JMP, JMP research, it was discovered that about 60% of, of Nigerians depend heavily on groundwater resources. Because in Nigeria, we have the liberty to dig boreholes and wells without any restrictions. So in this case, most households and most dwellings depend heavily on these groundwater and bore resources for their daily consumptions of water. On top of that, it was reported by the Ministry of Water Sources that there are about 65,000 boreholes in Nigeria as of 2013. So the GIS technology. How do I use GIS technology to, to determine the groundwater potentials? Specifically, I use the remote sensing data where I use the Landsat imagery and the and the and data from USGS. But adding that in, into GIS, I was able to analyze all this all this data in order to to, to get insight of the possibility of locations that I should look into if I, if, if I want to get excellent groundwater resources. And on top of that, Kuma in 2013 analyzed and, and reported that groundwater resources can be effective by using GIS and remote sensing models. My research objective to investigate the proportions and spatial orientation of groundwater resources in, in Lagos. That is, where and where should I situate my land if I'm planning to depend heavily on water availability? This is Lagos State, Nigeria. It is located, it is located in the southwestern part of Nigeria whereby we have a lot of people there. Lagos State has about over 16,000 people living in Lagos. And as a matter of fact, it is the most populated city in West Africa. Lagos State also controls the, 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 the financial and economic goods of Nigeria and West Africa to be precise. Data styles and, and sources. I used nine thematic maps to develop the groundwater potentials in Lagos. And some of them are the geology, gotten from the US just explorer, the land is lack cover from Landsat 8 imagery. I used the slope data from my DEM from the from my USGS explorer. I use the for for climate engines. And I'd like to add that not all these data are readily available to download on these sources. But I use some of these, my GIX skills and expertise to delineate like the limit density, topographic wetness index, the, the, the slope for my DEM, the density for my drainage line, and some other factors. These are from computations and server computations on ArcGIS. My approach. I use the AHP process developed by SATI in 1970. This AHP is one of the numerous examples of 
multi categorization analysis making. I involve MCDA, MCDA because I, I'm having several factors that can be contributing to the to groundwater resources in Lagos. For instance, geology of Lagos. For instance, the rainfall of Lagos. Uh, another example, the limited density of Lagos. All these factors are what are, are brought into consideration. And as a matter of fact, I need to understand that how does this, this factor affect the, the, the potency of groundwater resources in Lagos? What way do I give them? I can't give them equal weight, so I have to do them scientifically in order to, to, to be sure that this is a, a well-proven a, a well start so that we get my weight for my ranking. The, the, and I choose the AHP among other multicultural analysis making because the AHP allows me to do a pairwise comparison of all these factors. For example, I do a price comparison of how rainfall and land use land cover affect groundwater water potentials. So, so the AHP model will allow me to accommodate all factors in this pairwise comparison, side by side comparison of all the factors involved in this process. The methodology. After the factors have been gotten from, 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 from the sources, I transfer to use the, the, the AHP process in order to get the, the various weights for these nine thematic factors. On top of that, I generated the weight from the AHP and went directly into my, my ArcGIS environment in order to do my weighted overlay. And on the weighted overlay, I was able to impute all the respective weights for my AHP AHP process. And from the weighted overlay two bus on the ArcGIS, I was able to get my groundwater potential zone mapping in Lagos. Although these are complicated process, but this is just a summary of the step-by-step -step approach in order to get the results in groundwater potential zones in Lagos. So the results, it shows that about a good percentage of Lagos have good groundwater potentials, which confirm my initial introductory statement that when I was growing up, there were relatively abundant water for us in Lagos. But I was just curious soon that we find the locations in terms of spatial orientation of where and where these groundwater resources might be more than some other parts in Lagos State, Nigeria. And, and you can see on the western part of Lagos, that is on, on the left-hand side, you can see that we have excellent and very, very perfect feed for groundwater potentials, even up to the center part of Lagos excellent part of groundwater potentials. But on the right-hand side, specifically on close to the Lagos Island, they are close to moderate or poor potential for, for, for water resources. Not that these areas do not have water, they have, but compared to the right-hand side, compared to the left-hand side, I mean the western part of Lagos, which have more potentials, for groundwater resources. These are the discrepancies. So if as an investor, if I'm planning to, to build a, a system that, that, that would depend heavily on water resources, I would like to consider the Western part of Lagos State, Nigeria. Specifically about 99% of Lagos states have access to good groundwater resources, but this may vary in terms of the, the the location and how close I can get to this while doing my, my site survey. So nine thematic map, map was used and four zones were, uh, were identified. The excellent zone, the good, the good, the moderate, and the poor. The poor is just about 1%, which is relatively infinitesimal to the total total land area of about 3,560 kilometers square of Lagos State. Lagos State, so, 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 so in summary, I could say 
Lagos State has about 99% of area which falls under good, moderate, and excellent groundwater potentials. Probably due, probably due to many reasons, which are not limited to nearness to the to, to the ocean, the the large amount of rainfall Lagos State experience yearly, and also the type of topography of Lagos State, Nigeria, and also the type of soil in Lagos State, which is relatively suitable for infiltration and underground movement of water. So, ju just be precise, 7% of, of Lagos states are excellent, 66% excellent, 60% falls under good, 26 under on, on, under moderate especially, and just about 1% fall under very poor potential for water resources. And on top of that, I would say my results correspond with the with the with the findings of of Oludayo in 2021, which stated that about a good percentage of Lagos fall under good potential of water resources, and only seven percent have poor suitability to water resources, to ground water resources. So my recommendations are, if I could get some 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 some, some data in terms of the pumping data of all these wells across this location, which will make it easier to, 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 to validate the results of this research. So I, 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 so I, I would like to acknowledge my, my industry in Nigeria where I, I did this work, Observation at Anzi Consult, Lagos State, Nigeria, Department of Geography, University of California, Santa Barbara, and my research group, the Clever, the Clever Research Group for this wonderful opportunity to present in this conference. I will hang around if you need to ask any question about the research and for other collaboration, I'll be to extend the work in California or any other part of the world. I'll be, I'll be free, willing, and be so glad to share my data and my processes with you. Thank you for listening.